Yep, at like two o'clock in the morning, going down, going down the road, and I was just had so much on my mind. I was so tired of fighting everything. I was, I was like, you know what? And just took the steering wheel and jerked it as hard as I could, flipped it, and hit all types of things. Yeah. The thought of, you know, offing yourself. Did that happen continuously for a while? Was it a decision that just happened while you're driving down the road, or was it something you was like? It was something that was building up. It was a lot of depression, a lot of depression, and um, I kept trying to stop using, but I was always so exhausted, you know, that I just kept using. Just it got to the point to where. Like, stuff has been on my mind, you know, for, for a couple of months. But I'm just like, Boslin, you can get through it. Like, you got this. Like, keep going. And then finally, I'm just like, man, you don't got this. Everything is going downhill. Like, f*** it all. You know, and that's kind of when I made that hasty decision that night. You just got to the point that you didn't see an end to it. You... I, I didn't. Rosalind. Yes. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. I appreciate you making the time. We've been trying to do this for like four weeks, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, a couple weeks now. Yeah, and like you are saying, been having problems with the kids and stuff, right? Yeah, a lot of them. All so. right. So introduce yourself, man. Tell us, you know, name, age, things like that. So my name is Roslyn. Um, I'm 27. I'm from Winchester, Virginia, and I grew up in Winchester majority of my life in West Virginia. Okay. And how long have you been clean and what did you use? Um, so I started out using heroin and I got clean of that, um, December the 14th, 2018. Okay. Um, did a little bit of relapsing year down the road and started using meth. Um, here in April, I'll be exactly two years clean of methamphetamines. Okay. So I've, I've had a couple of people say from heroin to meth, which seems so crazy, right? Because it's down to up. Yeah. What? So, um, and in my situation, you know. I didn't really, I was using heroin, but it was about seven, eight months um, in 2018, and then I just quit. It was just something, I mean, I wasn't really big into it, but by the time I wanted to stop, I was I was going through withdrawals and things like that, and that part scares you when you go through that, so you keep using and you keep mm-hmm. using, so that was kind of my situation when it came to heroin. Yeah, it definitely becomes dependent quickly. Yes. Now, methamphetamines, you know, I used to work two and three jobs at a time. Mm -hmm. So it kept me going, you know. Um, And then I ended up really liking it, you know, and it became a big factor of my life. Um, And then when I try to get off of it, you know, I just that that depression that you hit, you know, coming off of meth. Okay. Um. You know, because all you want to do is sleep and things like that until you feel normal again. I just, I couldn't, I didn't like that feeling. So so it's a different withdrawal, but the same fear. Yeah. So I just kept using and I was able to, you know, do everything. You know, like I say, there's not enough time in a day. So that kind of made more time, I feel like, you know. Uh, So did you go on like, what, how long, what was the longest you ever stayed awake? Um, so the longest I stayed awake, um, was probably about nine days, nine days straight with no sleep. Nine days straight. Are you, like what's going on in your head at that point? Um, so, you know, I seen some shadow people here and there, you know, um, it made me real irritated. I didn't want to be around people, you know, the first couple of days, like, you know, Hey, you know, up with everybody doing this, doing that, you know, but then when you get to that many days, it's like, you know, you, you want to be away from people, you know, so, it gets uh, that underst- paranoia. Feeling. Right. So I understand <laughs> the way pills work. Like you start feeling that pain, you start feeling that withdrawal, sweaty palms, all that kind of stuff, which makes you go back to it. What do you start feeling from meth that makes you want to go back and use more? So, um, you know, like like me, for example, you know, I had two or three jobs. So when I would stop using to try to get clean, you know, I didn't want to be at work. I was just exhausted. And, you know, the boost up made me, you know, want to go to work, you know, want to do this, want to do that. You know, it was that that couple of days of trying to be sober and just being so exhausted from using an right. upper, you know. So you basically just recharging your battery like the yep. recharge the meth battery. Let's go to another three jobs for another six days. Yeah. So at the end of the nine days that you didn't sleep, like what? Did you sleep? What happened? So, yeah. So, finally, I crashed. And, I mean, I probably crashed. I don't know. People was telling me maybe two days. 
I would get up, they'd see me walk to the bathroom, or they'd see me <laughs> eat something, like my Swiss rolls, and go right back to sleep. So I did that for about two days um, when I finally did crash after nine days. And then got back up and started using again? And did it again, yep. Okay. And it was just like a repeated pattern of that, you know? So I guess there's probably a point of it, too, there where you feel like you're succeeding because you're working, you're paying bills, you're making money. Yeah, right? and you, you, know, you feel like you're emotionally and, and mentally good, you know, because you're not thinking about anything. You know, you're focused literally on the task at hand that you're doing, you know. It's how I was when I was on meth. So. Tweaking, basically tweaking, right? Yeah. But if but, I was at work, I was focused on work. I wasn't focused. Like, my brain didn't go to anything outside of work. Right. Or, so you know, instead of focusing your tweak on tearing things apart in the garage like some people do, <laughs> you focused it on work. Yep. Work and things I had to get done. Yeah. Hmm. It was my big. So... Finding productivity and addiction, huh? Yeah, yeah, I know. Because <laughs> it was always pills before bills for me. I didn't care about none of that shit. I just wanted to get high and everything else was secondary. So that's that's interesting to see functioning addicts, I think. For me, it's interesting because I'm not a functioning addict. When I'm out there, there's I'm just not accomplishing anything. Yeah, um, that's just like when I was using heroin, you know. I, w- I would get up in the mornings. I would take a shot, you know, because um, I injected heroin. Okay. Um, I would take a shot, go on about my daily day, go to work, get the kids, all that stuff. And, you know, I would just do that every day so I wasn't sick. So talk about how the heroin started out and how it ended. Like, how did it make you feel at first? And then did it start with snorting? Did it start with eating? Like, what did you? So, yeah. Um, so it was kind of introduced to me. Um, and when it was introduced to me, I was kind of, you know, iffy on it. So, um, finally after, you know, probably a couple of weeks of, of seeing it around and stuff, uh, you know, the first time I did it was snort it. Mm-hmm. Um, the person that I was doing it with, um, started e- injecting and then I kind of tagged along too and felt, you know, it was better in this form, that form, you know? Um, so then from that point on, it just rocketed with, you know, injecting it. Um, it stopped when, um, I caught my first charge. Okay. Uh, my only charge I have is a possession. Um. Of heroin. Yes. Okay. Um, and when I stopped, uh, was because I went, um, to jail. Uh, I was on first offenders in pretrial at the time. So, you know, I came back dirty. They locked me up. I got out, you know, said I wasn't going to touch it. Well, you know, I was also... You know, giving it to people at the time and making money off of it and stuff like that. So I started back up again. And then when they took my kids, I never touched it again. They took my kids December the 14th, 2018. Okay. And that was the last, that was the end of it. That last time I ever touched it. All right. And then you moved to the meth for. Uh, What do you mean? You moved from there to the meth, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. About, I was clean from everything for almost a year. Um, and meth came around and I was juggling social service, you know, having to take their classes, their mm-hmm. courses, mm-hmm. working 10 hour shifts. I was always exhausted. And mm-hmm. when it got introduced to me, they're like, you know, Hey, you know, it, it boosts you up. Stop being tired here. So I, you know, first time, you know, I snorted it. Um, and, and the burn was just too much. And I was, you know, used to injecting anyway. So I went to inject in and and realized, you know, I was off to the races. So I've also heard people compare the injection of heroin and the injection of meth. What's the similarity? What's the difference? To be honest, I don't think there's a similarity. Okay. I don't I don't feel like there's a similarity. Um when I injected heroin, I it was like a just uh an instant different feeling. Okay? Um I don't even know how to describe the feeling. And then you immediately go down, you know, injecting the meth. There was immediate hot sensation from your toes up to your head. And then you were wired. Ready to roll. Ready. So it, to me, it was a big difference. So which people, you know, never was like, you know, how do you go from one to right, the other? Right. I'm like, honestly, I really I don't know how it happened, but I guess I'm more. I enjoyed meth more because I was more of an up person, Mm -hmm. you know, I was always proactive, like, you know, I'm always doing something. So that kind of helped me 
keep going instead of dying down a little bit. At first, when you first start taking the opiates, too, for me, it was pills, you know, instead of the heroin. But it gave me that little rush of let's go get a bunch of shit done. Yeah. So, so you probably got at times, that at first, right? So, yeah, at times, heroin did do that. Like, you'll, I'll have, like, I don't know, maybe an hour or two of, like, feeling up, and then I'd be put, like, way down. Right. So. Next thing you know, you're nodding and drooling on yeah, yourself. Yeah, you're, and you if know, you want to be up doing something, you hate, yeah, oh, ain't that the truth. Look, I've. I've done it all, probably. <laughs> right. I've wrecked a lot of cars. In like a six-month yes. time, I think I went through like eight cars or something. Just yeah. destroying shit. Yeah, so I got shit. people that will verify that Rosalind is no good in a car on heroin at all. Okay, so <laughs> you, so from there, they take your kids, and this is like a big consequence for you, right? Yes. Okay, so this makes you turn everything around. So I grew up a couple years in the system growing up. Okay. So I know what it's like. Um, my kids did not go into foster care. They did go with family. Uh-huh. So, which was a blessing, you know, my Absolutely. girls. Absolutely. I'm there. I, I had the same thing happen to me. So I yeah. get that. Definitely a blessing. Yeah. So my girls, I did ask their father, which had no custody or no rights over them, um, to take them for a while for me to get my life together. Uh, my mom and my brother took my boys at the time. Um, I only had two girls, two boys at the time. And how many kids do you have now? Now I have six. Okay. I have six. Um... So that's kind of how that happened. And, you know, when the meth got introduced to me, I was like, oh, you know, I can, you know, I can fake them out. You know, I can do this. I can do that. You know, and it was going like that for a while until it was getting to the, be the point to where I was like, yeah, I, I don't want to stop. You know, how am I supposed to do all this stuff every day you know, that they want me to do and have no energy to do anything? Right. You know, just exhaustion, you know, so then it starts messing with your mental. You know, so that's kind of where I was at when it came to, like, the kid's point of view, you know. Um, so you're trying to get your kids back. They take you, they take them from you for heroin. And then as you're trying to get them back, you start using meth. You're making excuses to yourself, telling you this is going to help, right? Yes, yes. It's helpful uh, because you can get more done. Yes, um, which was not the case. Okay, so um, it becomes a problem after a while. Yeah, it definitely becomes one of my biggest problems. Um you know, and I ended up getting my boys back. My mom gave me custody back of my sons. Okay, so this is before the meth's done, before so, you're done with the meth? or So this was in between. Okay. So I started using meth and got clean of meth. Okay. Was clean of meth about 10 months. Okay. Um, And my mom seen I was doing very, very well, and she handed me custody back of both my boys. All right, rebuilded that trust, but it took a little while. Yes. Um, so I did get them back, and I was with um, an ex of mine, and meth came back around, and this time my sons went in the system. Hmm. So, um, you know, my girls were still at their dad's, you know, okay. safe, you know, because I was working on getting them back. Um. You know, and from that point on, it was just, that was probably a battle, a big battle after relapsing that time. Um, my sons now currently are still in the same home um, that they got took into. Okay. Um, they are adopted. Um, I signed an entrustment a couple years ago for that. Also, my so my two other kids, um, at the time, at that time I had four. Now I have six. So my youngest is at home with me. Um, my child before him, my daughter, Layla, um, I was still having a hard time, you know, when I was pregnant with her and my sons were still in the system. I was still trying to work to get them back. Um, when she was born, she was taken from me. Okay. So at the hospital. God, it had to be tough, right? Yeah, it was tough. Um, I was sober at the time, but when I came home, I was sober for probably all about three weeks. And I was like, you know what? I cannot do this again. You know, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. I cannot fight them again. And I started going 100 miles an hour again and went back to jail. Okay. And pulled the whole summer in jail. And when I got out, I've, I've been clean since right before I went in. So that was the summer of? Of 2022. 2022. So working on two years at this point, right? Yep. So you say you give up, I guess, conservatorship, whatever, for your sons. And my daughter, Layla. Yeah. How do you make that choice? Like, how hard is that to say, I'm in this position? So it was, it was a battle because I was fighting social service to the point to where I was mentally 
going crazy. I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and you know, everything I did to them was wrong. Even when I was sober, you know, even when I tried to remain sober, like they just always came after me with something or another, you know, practically telling me I wasn't good enough, you know, even when I was showing them, hey, I'm changing, you know, so when they started doing that and making me feel that way, you know, that, hey, what am I doing this for? You know, I started acting out again and using and I finally was like, you know what? My sons need stability. And that was how I made my choice. I I mean, my mother sat with me for hours at one point trying to figure out what decision I was going to make because it was so hard to make it. And she just kept, I remember her telling me over and over again, the choice has got to be for the kids. Right. It's got to be for the kids about their long term, not how you feel right now. And I was going through it, you know. So finally, you know, I thought about every aspect of what my sons needed, you know, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to make this decision solely so they have stability. Right. You know, because mom going in and out of jail for, for dumb little stuff, you know, and, you know, relapsing and, and not being able to pull herself together. I was like, you know, this is not stable for them. Mm-hmm. So, so you're arguing with yourself a lot in that moment because you you know you're the consequence that, you know, they're suffering your consequences. Ex- exactly. And that was very, very hard. Um, it was extremely hard because, you know, my boys are everything. You know, my son Jace I had when I was 16 years old. You know, he rocked with me through everything. How old is he now? He is 11. Okay. He is 11. He'll be 12 this year. And he is the perfect is young man ever. <laughs> so, uh, so with that relinquishing of whatever, can you get them back? Is that like something that's in so, the... So um, the entrustments that uh-huh. I signed is solely for them to be adopted by okay. the ones that they were with. Um, it comes with visitations, um, birthday parties, um, whatever me and the foster parents agree on. And me and their foster parents are, I mean, like two peas in a pod. Okay. We, so you get along well? We get along very well. I go to all my son's sports. I get to see them any weekend I want. Uh, we throw the birthday parties together. We throw holidays together. We make sure all the kids are there with each other. Like all six of my kids get to see each other all the time. So it's very, I am, I'm glad I made the choice that I made back then mm-hmm. because I feel like we wouldn't be where we are today. You know, and if I didn't make that choice, you know, if I would have kept fighting and, and and putting them through hell, you know, that... For your own selfishness. It, exactly. That, you know, they would be distant. But me and my kids are, I mean, we're connected like no other. Even though every, like, we've sat down, had discussions with them of, of what happened, you know, that mommy needed help, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And me and my kids couldn't be no more closer. All of them. Because you're keeping it real, right? Yeah. So, and at first I used to, you know, try to tell little white lies to them, you know, because they didn't know what stuff was, you know, and just, I feel like I was told a lot of things early and it made me grow up early. Okay. So, you know, I try to shelter them a little bit, but then I come to find out that, hey, they need to know these things because then they're wondering, you know, what they're doing wrong. Right. You know, if it's them and it's not them, it was me. So are are you... How was your childhood? What did you grow up? Middle class, lower class, upper class, mom and dad both in the house? So uh, my mom and dad was together till I was three. Um, my mom works three jobs. That's where I get my worth ethic from. Um, you know, she raised us by herself uh, majority of the time until, you know, we got into the system for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, the system was hard. Um there was a lot of, you know, sexual abuse um, when I was in foster care. You know, there was a lot of just things that kids should not, you know, go through. Right. You know, so that part right there, you know, and also I had a little sister that was in the same home as me. So I was, you know, raising her. Right. You know, um, she was attached to me like no other, you know, and we were we were growing up together in the same homes. Um my mom had a total of six kids, so we were all kind of separated. Um, some of us got to be together, and some of us didn't. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a lot of things. And then my life started getting a little bit better when I, you know, was able to go back home to my mom. Um, and from that point on, I did have a rough, you know, teenage years. I dropped, I got pregnant with my son. I dropped out of school and started working. I got into an abusive relationship right. um, that was years and years long. So I want to rewind real quick to the foster care. Like, are you living in different people's houses? Is this a home with so, a bunch yeah. of kids, a dorm so, area? Uh, so no. So um, we got placed in, in a home, you know, with, with a mom, a dad. And sometimes there was, you know, foster brothers and sisters. Um, me and my sister, we were just going with, you know, a husband and wife, and it okay. was just us um, until we ended up in one home that had two sisters and one brother. Um, that's where everything kind of flipped upside down, you know, for me and my sister. So that's kind of where the abuse, the sexual abuse started happening in that home and stuff like that. So it, it's just so crazy that these people can, and these people are being paid by the state to take care of foster kids, correct? Oh yeah. And they and, still to this day are taking care of foster kids. And they're predators. So the mom and the dad is not... It was the brother. Oh, okay. Yes, it was the foster brother. Do you think the parents knew about this? So, I don't, as I recall, and my memory is pretty good, um, they didn't know anything about it until they walked in on what was happening. Oh, so yeah. they, they found out, though. Yeah, and we, yes, they found out um, big time. And it's crazy because those three kids that they had that I thought all these years were their kids was kids, three kids that they adopted. So they were all foster kids. They were getting paid for all five of y'all. In yeah. And they ended up adopting, you know, these three kids before me and my sister came. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought, you know, they were just, you know, kind of one big family. You right. know, and me and my sister was the oddball. But it was all of us that was really the oddball. So, so how much attention did they pay to you guys? Like, did they play with the kids? Or was it just like, here's your cereal. Go have your day. It's bedtime. So they were church-going people. Wow. But it, so we didn't have TV in the house. Okay. Okay, we went to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. Everything they did evolved around church. Everything. Um, I remember... We were sitting in the living room, had to read from the Bible. I don't know if it was every night, but I know it was majority of the nights. Um, you know, they, I don't remember them playing much with us. So the foster um, I remember the, the, the sisters. Now, the sisters played with us all the time. Okay. And they were years and years older than us. Um, so the, the three that they had were teenagers at this point that they've had f their whole life since they were babies. So we were, and these three big, are these three are related. Is this so? Yeah, those all three, three are related. Are actual brother and sister. So is the brother fucking with the sisters? So I don't, I don't, I never knew. I never knew. <sighs> That's so deep, yeah. man. It's deep because it's just creepy that these people get paid and then those things happen under the roof and they're not even, you know, they don't even know that it's happening. So when they do find out, what happens from there? So, uh, me and my sister get taken. We get split up. Damn, okay. She goes to a house that she, I guess, ended up getting adopted from. We're still trying to find her. No shit. Uh, How we, long ago was that? Um, wow. Um, I don't know, about f 14, 15 years ago. Damn, okay. Or so, yeah. So, y'all get split up? So, we get split up when I was roughly nine. Okay. Okay. So, when I was roughly nine, because my mom got us back when I was like 11. So, I only lived at my grandparents' house for about roughly two years. Um, so, I was about nine when they split us up. Um, she got adopted out, and I went to my grandparents' house on my dad's side, um, which I really don't, you know, know too much. We didn't have a connection. Um so, yeah, and that was the last time I seen her. So that's what happened after that whole, and I haven't, I mean, I know he went to jail. I know he got, you know, convicted or whatever. Um, I know that he currently died a couple years ago. Um, you know, and I know he got out of prison, I think, in like 2012. So that's did, about all I know what happened to him. Did so. you Did you intentionally keep up with him or was these just information you were 
So it's just information that just came to me. Okay. Like, I didn't even know he was out of prison until he was on my doorstep. Oh, he shows up at your house. So I have This my, is the son, right? This is the son. Okay. Yeah. So he ran into, I guess, my baby daddy at the time who I was with. Mm -hmm. They were chopping it up or whatever, oh, and he no. brought him home. And when he told me his name... And then he wanted to hold my son. No way. Yes. And I, I freaked. I let, you know, the guy I was with at the time, I was like, look, I need to sit down and tell you something. And we went inside. I told him, he was like, what? He was like, that's him. Cause he already knew, you know, what happened, you know, when I was. A, but didn't know the guy. But didn't know his and name. And now he's didn't. fucking bringing him to the house. And yes. So it was a big thing. Um, it messed me up a little bit mentally. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and then, um, I still talked to one of his sisters and, um, so I, I heard, you know, that he, you know, died, you know, it was going around that he died. His name was like popping up all over like social media and stuff like that. And yeah. So that's the only how I know, you know, what kind of happened to him <sighs> over the years after the, all this. Small ass world, right? Yeah. Like, how mean, does that come for full circle that way? Yeah. In your face is just crazy. Yeah. So we're actually in the process of trying to find my baby sister. So because my mom had six, you know, me and the two older ones, we talk. Uh, we hang out, you know, we're brother and sister. Mm -hmm. We just got reunited with our two younger brother and sister that are both in the army. Um, and now we're just trying to find one more. So if you could tell anybody out there that might see this, who she is, what she looks like, anything like that to contact you or something like, what would you, what would you say? So her birth name, um, was Nikki DeHaven. Um, we have no idea who adopted her. Um, I wouldn't even know how to describe her besides what she was the last time I saw her. You know, she had, time ago. she had brown hair. Her, her face was like Miss Pebbles. If anybody know who Miss Pebbles is, okay. a round little chunky face. Um, she was, she was real small, um, just full of joy, you know, back then. Now, what she would look like now, you know, she had brown eyes. I ha I would have no idea. Hmm, that's I would awesome. have no idea. If you could find the her from through this right here, that would be so sick. That, yeah. Uh, trust me, I've the last couple of weeks I've been pressing some people. Okay. So, like the SS and them, because I know you guys know, you know, and she's over the age now, you know, that you guys can tell us a little bit of information. Right. Let me find my sibling. Yeah. Help me find my sibling. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping um, they've been willing, you know, to possibly try to look into some things for me. So. Hopefully yeah. It, hopefully it, it will, out. man. Yeah. Hopefully it will. So you're still working with them for the, your kids and everything, too, right? So Is that no, something you're OK? No. So I have been done with DSS since 2022. Mm -hmm. um, currently, they did show up on my board doorstep. A little over a month ago, claiming that I was on drugs, claiming that they got some reports that I was on drugs. So, you know, I immediately call my mom. She comes and gets the kids. I don't let that woman leave my side at all. We go to urgent care. I scream for her. The next day, we go pull my hair out. Results come back, and the only thing I failed for was THC. Mm -hmm. And they were they were surprised. They were really surprised. Like, I have the DSS workers, you know, talking about Rosalind, like, I'm so proud of you, you know? So. Well, I've always learned that the best dictator of future behavior is past behavior. Yes. So they've looked at the eight, ten times that you've crashed, and they expect you to crash again. Yes. And then when you don't, they're surprised. Yeah. Well, and especially if they're, if they're really I, rooting for you, then they're they're happy for well, you. Well, they're really surprised because I have three kids at home out mm -hmm. of my six. My daughters, I got back in July, full custody. Their dad has no rights. And I have a 10-month-old son at home that I went through my pregnancy awesome at. Um, I was in a recovery place for a full year, Brightview. Okay. Let me tell you, that place is, I mean, amazing. My counselor helped me through so much mentally where I'm able to cope with uh, 
any just about anything now. You never see me down. I'm I'm always like a happy go lucky, mm -hmm. making the best out of everything. Like they helped me change that around tremendously. So that was an outpatient thing too, yes. right? Like what could you if you could put a finger on two or three things you learned there that you can define, what would it be? So um I mean, they work well with anger. That's that was one of my biggest thing. I was for the last couple of years I've been so angry. Um, and they helped me, you know, transform, you know, my mindset into the happiness and being at peace and, and, you know, not focusing on the regret, just focusing on the future. Um, they've taught me really how not even to, to think about using, mm -hmm. I probably haven't thought about using since at least a year okay. at least now the first like six months i was clean it was you know it would pop into my head every so often you know and, and think about it i wouldn't act on it but you know it, it'd come across or i'd hear somebody talk about it and i would get these little feelings you know um so they helped me tremendously with that you know and that was like something that was as soon as i started with them that was like our like one of our first goals. Um, you know, they're they're they are really good at everything that they do there. Okay. They are really good. And so they, it's Brightview, and where is that? It's Brightview, and it's on Martinsburg Pike, right behind the Sheets. And there's Winchester. It, yes. Okay. So if you're if you go to the Sheets on Martinsburg Pike, and you're standing out back of the Sheets, and you look directly back, you will see Brightview next to Highway 55. Okay, so. Let's just say something just happens. You're pissed. Something happens. You're madder than hell. What, are, what is your mind doing right at that point to say, I'm not going to go this direction. I'm doing that. What's switched? So uh, really, if I, I, it's hard to say because I don't even get mad anymore. Like it's, I don't know how much it would take to see me get mad because I just, I haven't like I've, I've stayed away from people. I've eliminated myself out of anything that that you know could affect me, and in, in any way, you know, and that could be you know with with anger, you know, that could a situation that could piss me off, mm -hmm. you know. I would just I wouldn't even put myself in those situations. Now I just think about what could happen before I go to do something or say something or this or that, you know what I mean, or get involved. You know, so that's kind of where I'm at. Like, All right, so you're proactive versus reactive. Yes. You're thinking about what's going to happen before it happens. Instead of this happened and I acted this way and now it's too late. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's just, that's kind of how I handle it now. But people, you know, they, they leave me alone now. You know, besides the little DSS stuff that people's been trying to do lately, that's just, that just falls off my back because you ain't going to fit in to catch me in nothing. Cause I ain't doing nothing. Right, <laughs> and it feels good to build that trust back up, though, doesn't it? Oh, to yeah. finally have the people that you let down so much trust you and believe that when you say you're gonna do it, you do it. Oh yeah, me and my mom used to. I mean, go throat to throat. I mean, have each other up. I can see that throats. from you. I can see that from you getting angry enough. I, I mean, I'm you don't act that way, but I can see your energy. Yes. taking you to and, a and level. And my mom is the same. We are a spitting image of each other when it comes to that aspect. So. When we get mad at each other, it it just it doesn't go good. And with in my active addiction, we were I mean having each other pinned up to the walls like hand to throat. I mean you know what mm -hmm. I mean. So mm -hmm. and it it got crazy. Like it at one point like me and my mom hated each other. And finally like you know now she is my my biggest support. I wouldn't if I didn't have my mom right now. I don't know what I would do. So realizing now, looking back, all these fights were probably because mom was trying to help you, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Majority of them, you know, and I was just, you know, it's my life. Let me do it. I'm not doing nothing wrong. You know, just finding ways to deny it. You know, back then, my three things was deny, deny, deny. You asked me if I was using? No. Lies. Lie. Every, everything, you know, and that's why I stayed to myself. And that's how my mom knew I was using because I wouldn't come around. I wouldn't talk to nobody right. because I didn't want to lie to anybody. So when, you know, so if I stayed to myself, stayed away, I didn't have to. 
Because then I wasn't explaining nothing. If you want to get your drink or something, dude, go for it. You're not locked into position. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. uh, I knew you had a good story just from the few little things that we've had a chance to talk about during tattoo sessions. You know what I mean? Yeah, Uh, that's my therapy right there. Yeah, yeah. for for, Yeah, and this too, man. I think this kind of works the same way. And I get to spend more time actually asking a legit question instead of concentrating on what. Yeah. (laughs) Where the needle's going, you know? Yes, I'm glad you came. So, uh. Let me think. Um, is there anything you do on a daily basis that keeps you clean, like meetings or phone calls or therapy? So I quit my program. Turn this just a little bit closer. Yeah, perfect. There I quit go. my program in September of mm-hmm. 2023. Okay. So I started with them September of 2022. Um, I was in there for a year you know, completed everything, you know, took six weeks of pregnancy groups like I did the most. Um, and that's that's what helped me, you know, get find the balance of where I am now. Um, even being, you know, recovering addict. Um, after them, you know, my my main support system has been my mom. If I'm going through anything or I feel like something's getting a little out of whack, you know, whether if it's just Things going on, you know, like my son's surgeries coming up, Typ- stuff like that. Typical you know? life. Yeah, typical life stuff. I just, I call her and she's my therapist. You know, she she's there for me, you know. And I got, you know, my brother. You know, if I ever need him, we're like this. I mean, you couldn't get a brother and sister no closer. You know, I'd go to bat for him, same as he would for me. And, and we both kind of go through a lot of the same mental um, issues, Okay. So, you know, when I come to him about something that that's really, you know, I know he can relate, you know, and not just somebody kind of, you know, so really, you know, that's all I do. To be honest, I probably wouldn't have time even if I tried. <laughs> right. You seem like a very busy person. So I was working two jobs until New Year's. And I said, you know what? I was working seven days a week and, ra- you know, raising my kids. Um, finally, New Year's hit. And I said, you know what? This year is going to be about quality time. Whether it's what building on relationships, you know, quality time with all the kids, you know, and so far it has worked tremendously. Like we've been out and done quite a few things together. I've had I've spent most of my weekends focusing on the kids now that I don't work. Right. I only work Monday through Friday. So and you, you know, actually get to make a plan for the weekend then. Yeah. Right? So yeah. yesterday, like we went mini golfing and stuff, you know. Nice. We had you know, we just we had a blast, just me and the me and the three kids. That's what's up. You know, so I've you know, so when I quit that job, I was like, you know what? So Monday through Friday, I'm maintained at work. When we get home, I'm so busy for the three hours that we have until bedtime for school work, getting ready for the next day, all the baby stuff ready for daycare for the next day, all that good stuff right. that that keeps my mind occupied. And on the weekends, you know, we, we do stuff. You know, we spend time together. So really, you know, I don't I don't feel like I have time to think about any of the negative. You know, I'm too focused on all the positive things going on and, you know, kind of building my kids' future mm-hmm. when it comes to, like, memories of their childhood. You know, so that's, like, my focus right now. So, um, so... Let's talk about, are you on any prescriptions, methadone, suboxone, no, any of those things? I None went, of those things? No, I I have, so I've never taken methadone. Um, I have taken suboxone, not through a provider, but just on the street. Right, right. Um, the first time I tried to get off heroin. Mm-hmm. That was about the only time I've ever taken it. Um, I've never really used it to get off anything. Um, I've just always quit cold turkey. Okay. So I just suffered, you right. know, for a couple of days, a week or so, and then, you know, started back trying to get back to reality and, and what's going on around me. So how about alcohol? So I do drink occasionally. Okay. I do. Um, Strawberry daiquiris are my favorite now because I don't touch liquor too much. Um, When I was a teenager, I did have a little bit of a liquor problem. Um, so I really stay away from liquor from time to time. Like we have an Irish trash can or something like that. Um, but now maybe, you know, once or twice a week in the evenings when we get home and it's been a long day right. while I'm cooking dinner. Yes. I'm going to make me a little strawberry margarita. Right. Enough to get and, a little head spin without making me feel bad tomorrow. Yeah. So, you know, and I do smoke at nighttime. 
Right, so that's that my next yeah, thing was so weed. Yeah, so I do smoke. I got my medical card, all that, because I had to do it for probation anyway. Yeah, I did too. I did too. Yeah, so I already got that, you know, and I smoke at night. It helps me sleep peacefully without mm -hmm. dreams because I have a lot of negative. So that's interesting too. I was just talking to my buddy the other day about how weed suppresses your dreams because he stopped smoking so much. He's like, I'm having these crazy dreams. I like, quit smoking. He's like, yeah. Oof. I was like, bro, that's probably what it is because it suppresses that shit. Yes, I'm telling you, it's... I don't dream. If I smoke, I don't dream. Me neither. And when I do <laughs> have dreams, bro, I have the craziest fucking dreams, bro. They're crazy. I'm telling and you. And I wake up sweating or I'm, oh, I just don't like it. So, yeah, I probably yeah. feel that uh, yeah. more than I even know. Yeah. So that's like mine. Like, you know, I have this one repetitive dream. If I don't smoke or something for a couple of days, you know, because the baby's been, mm -hmm. you know, with with him fighting his surgeries coming up for his tubes and stuff. Um it, it's bad at night for him. Okay. Like he's in a lot of pain. Right. So there's some nights that I don't smoke because I want to be up for him. Like, you know, because I spend most of the nights cradling him, uh -huh. you know, trying to help him get through it, ease the pain down, the pressure, stuff like that. So I spend most nights like that. So sometimes when I don't smoke for three days in a row because, you know, he's, you know, having too much things going on with him for a couple of days, my dreams is abandoned houses and i'm running through floors and somebody's chasing me and all you just wake up and sweat and just like oh yeah we're smoking tonight we're crazy smoking tonight. right <laughs> have you ever looked up any of the like the no and i so i'm kind of like over my life I, I believe in ghosts and spirits and stuff like that and and like when my best friend passed away like i felt like there was things going on that it was him telling me things and stuff so I try to stay away from it because I get too interested in it. You know, it's something that interests me. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I've never looked up some of my dreams. Once you yet. start putting things in order, you'll be like, that's what this is. Yes. And you don't yeah. want that, right? Yeah. So I'm just like, yeah, let's just, you know. <laughs> huh. so. Yeah, that's interesting enough. Because uh, I feel like some people are purists, and I think some people are going to look at these podcasts and just think it's like, oh, well, you're still smoking and drinking and using drugs. But really, it's not if it's not destroying your life, right? Because if pot destroyed my life or alcohol destroyed my life, I wouldn't do it. If coffee destroyed my life, I would be doing my best to quit it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be doing my best to quit it too, but it's my morning rush. In the right, morning. <laughs> right. And I mean, there's still a lot of things that we do as addicts that are probably addict behavior. But, but every, so how I proceed with it is there is something that each and every one of us as individuals have to do, you know? People, I mean, people don't have to drink coffee in the mornings, but I guarantee you majority of people have to have their coffee in the right. morning or they just, they they say that they can't function correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's coffee. I mean, yeah, it's addictive, but there is, somebody can make anything around us addictive to them, you know, if they want. Yeah. You know, so there's always something that's addicting, you know, it could, you know, you could be like. A drawler, for instance, and you're always drawling. Guess mm -hmm, what that mm -hmm. is? Addictive behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's kind of how I see everything. Everything in moderation. Then. Yeah, yeah, you know. If so, you feel like you're doing anything too much, is it healthy or unhealthy? Yeah. So and that's when you got you know, take, take a look at things and be like, okay, well, you know, is this doing this to me? Is this doing that to me? You know. And I know they say sometimes, well, drugs don't do that to me or this don't do that to me, but it's something you had to have you know so of course it, it's addicting you know and and of course you know that's when you need to quit it <laughs> yeah once just, it becomes a problem in any way yeah just like with anything you know and well really drugs are bad for you anyway just because what they do to your mind your body you know your trust mm -hmm. you know everything you know so that plays a whole different factor you know but i you know, Before making the decision, it kind of comes back to, are you willing to pay the consequence? You know what I mean? Because I smoke cigarettes. It's a horrible habit. But I'm willing to pay, literally, the money of the consequence to, you know what I mean, have a cigarette. And eventually, just, I might pay a consequence of some kind of cancer or some shit like that. Just like me. I vape. I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. Right. I did. I stopped in August after my son was born. But you know there's a consequence, regardless right. if it's 25 bucks exactly, just to get a new one. I got to yeah, I got to pay for that. If I drop it, guess what? Right, you're I got to get a new one, Yeah, you're you know? still making the choice, right? So it's it's I mean, we all have a habit. We all have a habit, whether it's, you know, drugs or just something else. We're all we all have a habit. There I bet you there's not one person 
that can honestly sit there and say, I do not have one habit. Mm -hmm. There's something that you do probably on an everyday basis, at least one thing in your life, and that goes for anybody. Right, so don't sit back in judgment on everybody else. Uh, Yeah, you know, so that's kind of how I feel about it. (laughs) That's great, man. Well, I'm glad you have come to the, the, the spot that you are now. And I think, you know, keep moving forward, dude. You seem driven. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I got a lot of dedication now, you know, a lot of dedication and determination to get exactly where I want to be, you know. Um, And my main focus is just, you know, my kids having a childhood that they say, hey, we did this as a child. We did that, you know, and and the joy when they're older of being able to say that and the joy it's going to bring me, you know, to not want to hide their childhood. Mm hmm. You know, like a lot of us do. You know, a lot of us been to the ringer as kids. You know, it depends on what generation a lot of us grew and depend on how sheltered you were and things. Like, a lot of us went through a lot as, as a kid, a teenager, you know, even as a early adult. So, you know, I want my kids to be able to say something different a little bit when they're older. You know, we might not be rich, you know, but they have everything that they need and more. You know, they come first in every aspect of everything I do. I don't make not one decision with without, you know, them being the first priority. Right. So purpose, purpose in your life now. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, how I'm proceeding with things as, as they grow up, as I get older, you know, as I stay on the road to recovery. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. Hell yeah. That's what I like to hear. Uh, it is possible, right? Like, it, it, it at, is. at one point in your life, you felt like it wasn't. At one point, I was like, this is... At, at one point in my life, I tried to commit suicide. Okay. Okay. So it definitely got to that point where you was like, fuck all this. Way right before I got pregnant with my daughter, Layla, I tried to commit suicide in February, a couple months before I got pregnant with her. Um, because it was just too much. Just everything I was going through and then still using, I just... I was so tired of using, like I was so, every time I looked at a needle, it made me sick and I was still using, but it got to the point to where, you know, I was like, I just don't want to be here. I don't. And that's kind of the time that my mom, we got really close, you know, cause she found me, you know, and if it wasn't, if it wasn't for her, God only knows, you know, I try to avoid her for days at the end, you know, when I, I wrecked my car, cause I tried to, you know, Use my car to kind of kill myself. I wrecked on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, totaled my whole car. I was messed up for days. Couldn't move anything. Like you run intentionally into something? Mm-hmm. Damn. Yeah, right off the road. I mean, just I, fucking wow. Yep, yeah, at like two o'clock in the morning, going down, going down a road, and I was just had so much on my mind. I was so tired of fighting everything. I was, my boys wasn't coming home. Like I just everything was upside down for me and I was like you know what and just took the steering wheel and jerked it as hard as I could and flipped it hit all types of things yeah no shit yeah and my mom found out that my car was wrecked um because the GPS that the car place was like your daughter's car has been sitting in the same spot for like four days well she went up there and it was my best friend at the time and he was like she totaled her car and she but she's not here like she's fucked up and my mom started reaching out to me, Rosalind, please, I want to see you. Like, let me see you, please. Like, I'm, I'm not mad at you. Just let me see you. And I pushed her off for a couple of days and stuff. And, you know, and then finally I, I gave in. And that's when she's like, please, like, we got to, you know. So, so the thought of, you know, often yourself, did that happen continuously for a while? Was it a decision that just happened while you're driving down the road or was it something you was like... It was something that was building up. It was a lot of depression. A lot of depression and, um, you know, I kept trying to stop using, but I was always so exhausted, you know, that I just kept using, you know, because everything I was going through with DSS, you know, every... They make you bend over backwards like you wouldn't believe. Some people looked at me and was like, Rosalind, we don't even know how you're doing this right now. Like, how are you working 10 hours, going to class from 9 to 2? Like, I was sleeping two hours before class, two hours after class, and that's all the sleep I was getting, working a whole 10-hour shift at night. Like, it was it was exhausting having to keep up with everything, drug testings after drug testings after then having to go visit the kids. You know, you had to do that every week. You know, it just it got to the point to where... 
like stuff has been on my mind, you know, for, for a couple of months, but I'm just like, Rosalind, you can get through it. Like you got this, like keep going. And then finally, I'm just like, man, you don't got this. Everything is going downhill, like, fuck it all, you know, and that's kind of when I made that hasty decision that night. You just got to the point that you didn't see an end to it. You, I, I didn't. You could not find a solution, so you just felt like this is the end all be all. Yeah, and it was like every time I was doing good, you know, I'd be doing bad, and they would say I was doing good, but when I really was doing good, they swore to God, like, I was using, doing this, even when I was clean, but when I was using and active use they kept going around telling people i was clean and this and that like hmm. like how do y'all you know what i mean so i know yeah, right. so I was just ass like, backwards yeah like... i'm just like do i gotta keep using to approve y'all like it seems like y'all ain't coming after mm. me when i'm using right but and when it... i'm sober and and doing all these things and like being determined about it you guys are coming after me every which way so yeah it was you know that 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 shit was rough. It was rough, especially as a young parent. Right. You know, a young parent of multiple kids. Yeah. When, you know, I started raising kids since before I even had my first kid. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, that just kind of, you know, all played a part. And then now being able to look back and see that low spot in your life compared to where you are now, is it like a measuring stick? So, I mean, I was like way, you know, I was like here back then. I feel like you can't bring me down now at all. I mean, you could try all you want, but I'm just going to look at you and be like, okay. And, right, you know. Moving on. Yeah, moving on. Like, I don't get mad about nothing. Like, I stay to myself, me and my kids. Like, you know, I got some family that comes around every so often. Like, you know, my brother, my sister, my mom. I don't have friends. I really don't associate with people unless they're my coworkers. Um, I goof off with them all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's about it. It's, it's work and home. You know, I kind of, I don't surround myself really with a, a big group of people or really even a small group of people unless it's really family, right. you know, at this point. So, and, and I know all the hard work I've put in these last two years that I'm just like, man, you could tell me what you want. You could right. tell me I'm using, you could tell me I'm doing, and I'm just going to turn around and tell you, fuck you. Right. Like, come prove it. Right. Get out of my face. You know what I mean? Like, you don't, you are not that important to me to where I care what the hell you have to say. So that's kind of how I look at it from, right. from here on out. <laughs> right, right. So with that too, man, as we close out, like, what's your message to everybody out there? If you could speak to somebody right now that's stuck in addiction, that they're at that if low you, spot and they're thinking about are, crashing their car. I mean, if you are stuck, there's people out there. Believe me, there's people out there. I thought people were just pretending, you know, when they want to help and stuff like that. There, There's not. There's true individuals out there that want to see us succeed as addicts. So they will put in the effort. I know firsthand, Brightview helped me tremendously. If it wasn't for them, I don't know where I would be, you know, within my mentality and everything, you know, how I am as a person today, you know, and is there, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Right. There is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. I don't care what you've done to whoever you love, you know, to, to your friends, to your family, to uh, they will be there for you. You know, just just let them come around. Just start working on you first. Focus on you, not what's around you, not what people are saying, not what people are doing like you first mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, like make yourself the first priority. And I bet you you come out of it at right at Brightview. Is there a counselor? Name you can drop that you would send people to that you know and trust? Miss Sonia. Okay. Miss Sonia. She was my counselor almost the whole time. Um, and she is a wonderful woman. If you can't come in, you know, she she does Zoom meetings. Like you can meet her all different ways. You could do phone calls, you could do she and she keeps your shit private. She does. When when they say, you know, that Whatever you tell them is confidential with her, she means it. It is. She means it. That's good. And you can always, I mean, I used to email her even on weekends when I was having a bad day, you know, and she would get back to me. She is a wonderful woman, like a wonderful woman. Like, I I thank God that I met her when I did. Nice. Yeah, that's good shit. That's the type of stuff I want to put out there, that there is help. You know, you can find it. There's people that are willing to put in the time. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what you're going through, like, you can get out of anything. You just got to get determined, stay determined, 
Show some dedication to it. Yourself is number one. Don't do it for nobody else but you first. Because that's where I kept going wrong. Is I was getting trying to get sober and stuff for everybody around me, for my kids and all that. And when I should have been wanting to do it for myself. And that's where relapses really, really occur when you're doing it for someone else and not for you. Right. So first thing is you got to do it for you. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah, because it's about you. You can't help no one until you help yourself. Exactly. And nobody can help you unless you want to get help. Right. So do you do a lot of social media? Do you want to drop any social media links, anything like that? So I don't really do. um, My name is Rosalind Shear on uh, Facebook. Um, If you ever need to reach out, hey, feel free. You know, everybody says I used to be a therapist to them, so I'd be a therapist to you. I'm fine with it. Um, I don't do much social media, but Facebook, um, just because, you know, I keep my circle small. Right. You know, and kind of stay off all that because sometimes it just comes out of drama and I don't like to hear all that. So, you know. And it's always cool, but I love it when people say the same thing. 90% of y'all say the same thing at the end. You know, if you need to reach out, reach out. And I think that's awesome because this is a community of people that will talk to each other. Yeah. Regardless if we know each other or not, you know what I'm saying? You give us a little summary I've and most time we'll help you with out. Random strangers at courthouses and stuff, and they're like, hey, what'd you say? Really, you know, it's really helped. It mm-hmm. actually shows some light on it. So, hey, if I can show some light on your problem or, or give you a little bit of. You know, telling you that, yes, what you're thinking about is correct. Like, yes, you need to go with it that way or give you advice on anything. Look, I, I'm all for it. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I am a helper. I do like to help people. It's that's one of my so. downfalls, but it's also something that's very good when it comes to recovery. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So Sometimes you get that feeling from helping somebody out that just makes you feel a certain way, and it can last for days. It can last for weeks. Yep. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, at the end of this, I'm, I'm trying to be a recovery specialist in okay. a way. So that's kind of my career path. I'm trying to take here in the next couple of years. So. And I think those are right there. That's I was kind of really interested and cool into doing this with you right. here today. So. Right. And that I think that's another thing, too, because— 90% of the addicts that I talk to say that they can't uh, communicate with someone who hasn't been through it. So, I used to say the same thing. Right. I did eight years in school and I know this and let me yep. use these big words. That doesn't mean shit. Unless you know the feeling Unless, that we felt. Yeah, because I'm going to look you at know? you and be like, you don't understand, bitch. You yep. don't get it. <laughs> yep. Shut up. Yep. So from the, the perspective of you or me being able to get it, say, dude, I've been there. Yep. I understand it. I think that's where the therapy comes from more so than somebody judging me from Harvard. Yeah, exactly. That I said the same thing. Yeah, I, I think said it's the ridiculous. Same. Yep. So good luck with that, man. I think you could yep. be very, uh, I think you could work well at that. Yeah. And I hope this was beneficial, you know, to who whoever needed it, you know, even if they need a little inspiration or a little pick me up or a little whatever, you know, it is possible. Yeah. I hope somebody gained from this little session right here. Yeah. This is about the underdogs, man. Cause we're the underdogs. People never think we're going to come out of that shit. Yeah. There's always some point in addiction where they look at you and they're like, he's done. Yeah. They, they, they've rubbed their hands together and that's it. But it is possible to come out of all that shit. That's what this is all about. Yeah. And this is this is really awesome you're doing this. I you know, I actually look highly, you know, to you for, for doing this I and putting this, that. you know. So that's kinda awesome. I appreciate that. It's tough to put yourself out there, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's tough <laughs> to put yourself out and not know how many people are gonna see it or yeah. what they're gonna comment or how it's gonna make them feel. You just hope that it works and, and people can get something good out of it. Yeah. At least, yeah. you know, Little little tips for their own story to, you know. Right. So. Don't yeah. do the shit we did. Don't. Right. No, there's better things. <laughs> Absolutely. So, man, I think she dropped everything right here with everybody. So, like, you know, comment, subscribe, man. I think these are going to get better and better as we go. And a lot of y'all I want to come back to. Like, what if we come back in a year? I want to see where you are in a year. That's cool. I'm down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, shit I'm like that, that, man. Let's just kind of keep a little record. And you'll be able to tell your kids to go and look at these things in 100 years, 20 years, whatever, right? Yeah. That's what I thought was cool, too, because the date's right on the clapper. That was the day I did this, and it'll be there in 10 years. Yeah. So that's that's neat. I can't, you know, I can't wait to see what this future has to hold, you know, for this little spanking monkey right here. <laughs> that's what's up. All right. Thank you. All righty. Sweet, man. That was awesome. That dude. was good. Yeah, man. You're good. You're good on... You're good at talking, you're good on camera.